Hello and welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Dr. Jack and for this video we will be looking at cannabinoids, specifically CBD, and how scientists have discovered that we very well may be onto a new class of antibiotics and it will be the first new class of antibiotics since the 1960s. And we will cover topics such as the differences between different bacteria as well as how exactly bacteria evade our immune system leading to a big issue that we have today which is superbugs or essentially bacteria that is resistant to a lot of different antibiotics out there and what this means for us moving forward. So join me as we jump into the details. So welcome if you're new here, welcome back if you're not. This channel focuses on helping you live a healthier, happier life through knowledge. And if you're not a part of the community yet, please consider subscribing as well as hitting the like button and share these videos if you think others will find it helpful. But to begin this video, it's sort of in line with a lot of the videos that I've done on this channel. And that's my interest in cannabinoids, uh, the cannabis plant in general. And I've already presented a lot of information in regards to how cannabinoids help with things like sleep or insomnia as well as anxiety, um, epilepsy, and pain and things of that nature along with a whole host of other things. And if this does interest you, please go ahead and check out my playlist on my channel where I list all the videos that I've done about CBD. Uh, I basically created an entire little mini free course if you want to learn about cannabinoids and the cannabis plant in general and the amazing health and wellness properties um, of this plant. But getting back to the topic at hand, so scientists and researchers have now discovered that we might be on to an entire new class of antibiotics within the cannabis plant and specifically to the cannabinoids. And today we'll mainly be talking about CBD with a honorable mention of CBG as well. This is fantastic news because this will be one more antibiotic that doctors can arm themselves with to help fight various infections and especially these antibiotic resistant infections that have really become a pretty big deal probably starting around 2015 or so and leading to a lot of unnecessary suffering or morbidity as well as mortality. The WHO website lists an entire list of various bacteria that have developed antibiotic resistance that are of great concern and the WHO has discussed how antibiotic resistance on a global scale is leading to a lot of health issues as well as development of various countries and food security as well. And not only is it a threat to our lives, but it's a severe burden obviously on the healthcare system as well because individuals that develop these antibiotic resistant drugs or bugs um, will end up pr having very prolonged hospital stays and more complications as well. And needless to say, during a global pandemic and everything else, every hospital bed is crucial. And so it really has profound implications, especially today. Gone are the good old days when Sir Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin in 1928 and how penicillin has been able to treat so many different types of bacterial infection. However, over time, as the usage of antibiotics has gone up considerably and bacteria has basically adapted to these various things, it has led to a severe problem as discussed. And what's contributed to all of this are things like prophylactic usage of antibiotics in agriculture or livestock for our food and farming and things like that, as well as the overusage of antibiotics by the healthcare system and society essentially expecting every time they go to a doctor with a sniffle that they might need to walk out with an antibiotic prescription. And all of this has brought us essentially to where we are today. However, I do think that the healthcare system is uh, getting a lot better about all of that. I can tell you that when I first started practicing and would do various implants and things like that for patients for pain, such as spinal cord stimulators or intrathecal pumps and things like that, is that we would also give them a course of antibiotics to take prophylactically after the implant. However, research has shown that it really doesn't make a difference in regards to whether or not it will prevent the patient from getting an infection. And so no longer do we do that. It's also worth mentioning that antibiotics are diff very different from antivirals, which are used to treat viruses. And in those situations, the antiviral essentially slows down the replication of the virus so that it gives your body time to actually destroy the virus. Whereas with antibiotics, it actually helps in destroying the antibiotics directly. And obviously if you have a virus infection and you take antibiotics, it's not gonna help you. And if antibiotics are used a lot, you have to keep in mind that every time you take antibiotics, you also wipe out the good 
bacteria that's within your body, mainly within places like your gut. So the gut biome or the intestinal biome and all the good bacteria that's there, which is why you know people suggest that you eat yogurt after you have had taken antibiotics. Uh, we are finding more and more that it is very crucial to overall health and has significant long-term implications. And I very well might do a video on that, so uh, be sure you're subscribed and hit the notification bell so that you know when that video pops up. And another interesting fact is that essentially all human life depends uh, on bacteria because without bacteria, we wouldn't be able to produce things like vitamin B12, which is essential to DNA as well as cell function and other random facts I came across in my research is that the human body is essentially made up of a 10 to 1 ratio of microbes to actually human cells. And so you could think of us as more uh, microbial than actually human, I guess, <laughs> if you want to look at it that way. And I also came across someone mentioning, and I couldn't verify this, but that if you were to take all the bacteria in the world and weigh them, it will weigh more than every animal and plant combined on the earth. So feel free to check that out. And if you find out if it's true or not, be sure and let me know. But the ultimate take home message is that not every sniffle or mild cough is warranted to be treated with an antibiotic. The best thing to do is that if it lingers or if you feel very ill to contact your healthcare provider, and tell them about your signs and symptoms and how long they've been going on for so that they can determine whether or not it would be appropriate. I'm not trying to downplay how serious bacterial infections can be. It's important to note that these infections, if left unchecked, especially if they enter the bloodstream, something called sepsis or septicemia, people can get very, very ill or even die from such infection. Obviously, very serious infections in different organs, like in the lungs in the state of like pneumonia or something can affect your breathing. And even something like a urinary tract infection can start off small and eventually lead to end organ damage within the kidneys or something even worse. And so it's important for you to realize that you should seek your healthcare provider's guidance and have this discussion with them so that you know whether or not it's something serious to be treated or not, or if you just need to basically treat the symptoms. But before we get into the studies, one thing important to realize is that you can break bacteria essentially down to two different classes. One is gram positive and one is gram negative. And a lot of the differences have to do with things like how they stain on a pathology slide. When you look at them under a microscope, the gram positive show up as like a blue type color and the gram negative show up as a pink type color. And a lot of that has to do with the outer shell of the actual bacteria. And in a gram negative bacteria, the outer shell actually has an extra lining, which makes it more difficult to kill and for antibiotics to sort of penetrate that. So in these studies, what they ended up doing was exposing gram positive and gram negative bacteria to CBD. And when they did that, they found that CBD actually did help destroy the gram positive bacteria. And gram positive are things like, you know, staph aureus, or they're mainly on the skin and cause skin infections as well as various lung infections and various other conditions. And gram negative are more like salmonella or E. coli. And the results there were a little bit mixed, but what was interesting, and we'll get into a little bit more here shortly, was that it actually seemed to work better for antibiotic resistant types of gram negative bacteria. It's also important to note that bacteria come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. You know, they could come as circular, as more of an oval type shape, as well as spiral. And a lot of them have this tail called the flagellum, which basically allows them to kind of beat the tail almost like a rotor and kind of move around and do what they got to do. So the first study that I want to talk about is the Botanix Pharmaceuticals uh, with collaboration with the University of Queensland. And their head researcher, Dr. Mark Blaskovich, Blaskovic, Blaskovic, um, found that CBD can do what we just talked about. And as mentioned, things like Staph aureus, even MRSA, which is, stands for methicillin resistant Staph aureus, and Streptococcus, and as well as gonorrhea, which has been shown to be quite antibiotic resistant now. And within places like Australia, where this research was done, gonorrhea is actually the second most transferred um, or most rampant STD in the community. And they even found that CBD helps with various bacteria that cause meningitis and even Legionnaire's disease, which is another gram negative bacteria. And they believe that it does this by two different methods. And one is by destroying the outer cell membrane. This was discussed by Dr. Jane Klitgard, where she and her team found that CBD works synergistically or amplifies a uh, antibiotic ointment called bacitracin to kill gram positive bacteria. And she discovered that you needed a decreased dosage 
of bacitracin in order to accomplish the same thing whenever CBD was added to it. And obviously, if you're going to have a decreased dosage, then you'll have decreased side effects and actually it leads to less chances of resistance buildup to that particular antibiotic as well. She likened it to a battering ram to the cell membrane. And she also makes the comparison where it's like CBD comes in and basically shoots the bacteria in the leg and then the actual antibiotic comes in and finishes it off. And the other way that they believe CBD helps destroy bacteria is by essentially disrupting the biofilm. So what is biofilm? So when you have bacteria within your body and it's invading your body as a foreign substance, they stick to a surface and then they generate this matrix or this biofilm. And within this biofilm, it's essentially where they hang out. You know, they're sitting around basically sharing genetic information as well as nutrients and they undergo these various changes to evade the immune system. And within this biofilm, it actually has low oxygen as well as decreased nutrients and the pH of this environment is different too. So it's very hard for antibiotics to work there. So you can think of the biofilm as a protective barrier and it's a physical, chemical, as well as genetic barrier. And the NIH actually stated that 80% of human bacterial infections are biofilm associated and it's believed that the rebound illness that occurs when individuals say when you get sick and then you get better after a course of antibiotics and then a few days later you get sick again the belief is that it's because of this biofilm and the bacteria basically hiding out there and then slowly over time replicating and releasing toxins again to basically make you sick again and researchers have found that it's not just cbd that has these antibiotic like properties they found that cbg as as well has similar properties. There was a study done by McCaster University in Canada where they found that CBG was effective against MRSA and again that's the methicillin resistant staph aureus infection that is a huge issue. So just to kind of wrap all of this up it's pretty amazing how as time goes on and the cannabis plant gets more and more legalized and people are more understanding of the amazing properties as well as health benefits of cannabinoids as well as all the other phytonutrients or plant nutrients within the cannabis plant and again things that are specific to the cannabis plant like terpenes as well as flavonoids which I've covered in previous various videos and again and if you're so interested, please check the, all of that out. As this research kind of comes out, I'll uh, continue to kind of update you guys and create a video and put it out there. And as far as the t-shirt, I just got this t-shirt. I was running out for a little while, but uh, I figured it was fitting and appropriate since the CDC has made changes to the guidelines uh, for those people that have been vaccinated and so that people can go outside and you know you no longer need to wear a mask or socially distance in certain situations. Um, it's a little bit different as far as indoors, so be sure and uh, check out your local area and what the accepted guidelines are. But hopefully in that regard, we are on the brink of having things sort of go back to normal, at least here in the United States. Um, you know, at this time, obviously things in India are still pretty bad. So my thoughts and prayers are with them. With that, I'll leave you guys. So until next time, take care, stay safe. Bye-bye. Pura Vida.